cozy in here thanks to the fire that Neo lit this morning. So you're arriving right around the time that I like to arrive into the studio. I'm a sleeper inner and uh, I've been uh, just really enjoying these, these winter days to arrive slowly to the studio and then really get to work and see what comes. Uh, the first thing I usually do besides turning on all the lights, which Neo was kind enough to do and lighting the fire is I then um, just take a moment to arrive into the space um, emotionally and energetically. Uh, I usually begin that by putting on some music, which for sound quality today I won't do, but I also light a candle um, and just breathe and, and arrive. So I'm just gonna light a candle. It's usually over on the other side, but I'm gonna be here by my toothbrushes. Hopefully it's not a fire hazard. And just be here. My journey with, <clears throat> sorry, my journey with art has always been an intuitive, natural one. I really, I've never known the concept of, I want to be an artist because I was so blessed in my childhood by my family to be completely empowered and enabled and supported in my creative endeavors. There was never this concept of, I need to achieve uh, a goal or I need to arrive at some place and then I can have a career. So I've always had this innate creativity flowing through me. When I create, it's, it's really this balance of right brain, left brain, masculine, feminine, in breath, out breath of this arriving to the easel, doing the work, showing up, paying attention and balancing that with the intuitive flow, <clears throat> getting out of the way, allowing the painting to speak through me and really staying open to the mystery of the creative process. So that's really, I'm approaching this time together today um, in that same way. I've, I've had some ideas of pondering of things that I would like to share, but for the most part, I'm, I'm showing up and I'm going to just see what happens. I would love to hear from you if you have questions, whether that's about creative process, whether that's about intuition and, and flow and inspiration, whether it's technical, whether it's professional. Um, oh, there's my mama saying hi. Um, I give her kudos. She taught me everything I know. She gets all, all the, uh, the accolades and all the blame. Um, so really just, just being open to that process, we can together, um, co-create where we want to go today. So I welcome your questions. I welcome your, your concepts. If you have talking points that you'd like me to explore and, uh, we'll go on this journey together. As you can see behind me, I have a few paintings in progress. Um, actually this one here. I call her Space Granny, but the name of the painting is Origins, is my newest completed painting. I just finished it and posted it yesterday. So you may have seen that online. It's um, an oil painting, which is unusual for me. I've, uh, most, most of the time I've painted with acrylic. It's um, always been my medium of choice. I really enjoy the versatility of it and the, just the way I can travel with it. And if I dip my paintbrush in my tea by accident, it's not gonna hurt me. <laughs> well, unless there's cadmium, be aware of minerals. Um, but just, I've always really liked the, the way that it dries quickly and I can work very intuitively. I can change my mind, I can be unattached and I can really just listen to the painting and allow the creativity, creativity to flow and the inspiration to come as it's needed. However, over the last few months, I've been diving into the world of oil paints. And that's been really interesting for me um, to just see what tools and, and tricks might uh, be available through oil paint and uh, where it might offer me new perspectives and new process. So it's been really fun to get to know, it, get to know that. And um, yeah, I've been having a great time with it. I still feel my heart belongs to acrylic. So this one here behind me, I started a couple days ago. It's in the very open, loose beginning phases. It, from your distance, it might look um, quite 
developed. Um, but if, if you were to look closely, you'd see that there is still a lot of work. And if you're familiar with my work, I definitely have a way of um, really pushing the detail. And uh, it seems like that's my where my style goes is I really like to develop that magic realism and explore how I can make that image feel alive um, and convincing so that you can exist in the space with it. So those are two contrasting pieces. Um, overall, I'd say between oil and acrylic, I just, when I first started, I'll say, when I first um, was doing my first oil painting uh, this fall, it would be my second oil painting ever. Um, I was so excited. I thought, oh my gosh, I love oil paints. And then I realized I love painting. <laughs> so it actually, that was the, the clarity that came through is I could be painting in watercolors or drawing in the sand or, um, you know, doodling on a piece of scrap paper. And I think that the creative energy that flows through is what excites me. So it's not particularly the medium. It's not dependent on my location. It's not dependent on my subject matter or on the mediums that I'm using. It's, it's this tuning in and this connection with some creative force, some divine energy um, that that's what fills me with joy. And so if you've, you know, if you've been on the dance floor or you've been in flow in conversation, or if you're a musician and you've been jamming, or if you're, if you're a painter, which is likely from a lot of the creative people joining us today, when you get in that place, it's this bliss, it's this channeling, it's, uh, it's the samadhi, it's the, um, the Greeks called it genius. And they would never say that this person is a genius they would say this person has genius. So genius more as an energy, as um, a creative force, or almost as an entity that you can that you can romance and get to know and allow to move through you. It's I think of that as inspiration. <clears throat> it flows through, and we are all our unique channels. We all have our own way of dancing. We all have our own signature and the way that our hand moves across a canvas or a piece of paper. Only you can paint like you. Only I can paint like me. And it's, it's in that unique perspective that we can really channel this universal creative force into our own perfect facet of our own perspective. So all the stories that we've, that we've gathered through our lives, all the skills that we've put in our tool belts, these will push us in, in different directions. But I truly believe that the creative force that moves through us is from the same place, wherever that may be. And I don't, I don't believe in labels. I don't think we need to name what that is. You can give it cute names like God or source or whatever you want. But to me, it is this energetic creative force of the universe. And that's what excites me. So yeah, I'd say that that's, that's my opening spiel. <laughs> um, I saw one question pop up um, and Mia, did you see that question? We'll see. Uh, there's a question. It says, do you have any specific rituals to tap into the muse? Mm, good question. Um, truly, painting is my ritual. Getting into that place of creativity is my ritual. And I don't feel like I need to um, approach it from the same way every time. I don't, um, I don't have any dogmatic rules that I follow in order to arrive to that place of creative flow. Um, I can be in conversation, I can be listening to music, I can be sitting in silence or listening to a podcast, I can be at a festival on stage with thousands of people behind me, or I can be by myself with the rain falling outside cocooned in my studio by myself. It's the, the process of creating is the ritual. And it is 
an incredibly psychedelic experience. You are literally carving worlds out of nothingness. You're creating images that never existed before. And though they might echo other pieces or other um, influences, these are windows that are entirely unique to this moment in time. And these windows will remain, especially now with the digital era, that it'll be there forever. And when people sit in front of it, whether they see it on their phone, whether they see it in a gallery, whether they have it hanging in their home as the original, whether it's a sticker on their water bottle, um, however that image arrives to people's lives, this becomes a mirror to them. It becomes a reflection of, of the viewer. So that, that art making also is never finished. It's the, the ritual of the creative process continues on and echoes on because every viewer that sits in front of it is a new perspective and the story will continue on with their own experience. I saw another I love, question. I love that, thank you. There is another question. Uh, what is your favorite thing about painting with oils that acrylic doesn't offer? Hmm. Um, well, the fact that they are slow drying is, I'd say, a strength and a hindrance for them. They're, um, you can blend. So if you're going for like creamy backgrounds or um, blended wispy clouds or smooth skin tones or etheric glows, oils are a great way to get that. I've really been enjoying as I've been painting clouds. I'm like, oh my God, this is so much easier to paint clouds in oil than it is in acrylic. Um, acrylic dries very, very quickly, as we know, just especially depending on the medium or, or the pigment, sorry. So like raw umber, for instance, dries incredibly quickly. And so when you're working with acrylic, you need to either work very quickly if you're blending wet into wet, like you would do with oils, but in a more relaxed way, or you would work in layers. And I call this blocking and bridging. So bridges, if you imagine you take a black and a white with acrylic and you put them up next to each other in order to create the optical illusion of that being a smooth gradation. Whereas with oils, you would just blend them together and it would create gray. In acrylic, you need to mix that gray. So you need to mix that halfway point. And that's gonna create then three shades from white, gray to black. And then you would create more bridges and you would put mix halfway between that medium gray and that white and you'd mix that. And then halfway between the black and the gray and you'd mix that and then you'd have five. And over repetition of that process, and if you've ever done any of my classes or done my online tutorial, you would see that by building up these, these almost like a posterizing effect, if you've ever used Photoshop and you changed a photo or there's lots of filters on your phone now, you can change photos so that it separates. Or if, you, if you're familiar with uh, Banksy or a lot of the spray paint uh, graffiti artists where they make these um, very, very realistic images, but with only one, two or three uh, stencils, uh, solid colors. And so we're really creating that effect through acrylic paint. Whereas oil, you can just blend them. And so you don't need to worry about bridging. You're creating bridges just by that, um, by the very act of blending wet color into wet color. And then it mixes and creates its, its merge. Um, so yeah, that would be the main difference between the two and the main strength of oils. Whereas I also, I like to work very quickly. I like to change my mind and really stay open to the creative muse, stay open to the, the creative process and ideas that come spontaneously and feel really right in my body. I like to act on them. And um, I've really learned to trust that compass of my, of my internal uh, knowing. So when it feels right, feels in your body when you think like empowering true thoughts or when you when you speak untruths 
it's very much a tangible as you as you attune to it and you get used to it it's a tangible draining of energy or filling and so i've learned to really pay attention to that in the creative process and when i feel that filling energy when i have an, an idea that comes to mind i act on it and so with acrylic I can immediately act on it. Like maybe it's wet and I need to wait five minutes for it to dry or I get up the hair dryer and actually speed it up and then I can just go for it. And I can be very spontaneous. I can be very unattached um, and I can, yeah, change my mind very quickly. Whereas oils, I, you have to wait. And sometimes that's waiting for a couple of weeks. Um, and, and yeah, so it's just, it, it slows down the process, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, there is definitely a lot of advantage to the slow, methodical process of, acrylic, of oil paint and having to sit with it. I have multiple paintings around my studio right now that I'm sitting with while they're drying and I'm just meditating on and allowing what is next to come forward in perfect time. And um, Autumn, there's a question. Do you do you sketch out your uh, your paintings first or or do the ideas come while you're painting? Both. Um, I usually start with just the seed of an idea. And that might be um, like, for instance, this new piece. I had this idea in my mind for quite some time about the mane of a of a young girl and the mane of a lion merging. Um, and beside, beyond that, like this is literally what my sketch was. It was very loose in my sketchbook and it just sat there for, for months and months, if not a year. Um, I don't know what else is gonna come in that. It could transform. There could be parakeets and iguanas and exploding fractals and stars and whatever. Probably not. I feel like this painting might, might be quite simple um, and be closer to what you see now but I am open to what it's going to be. And um, it's really the creative process itself that, that feeds into and cultivates um, the, fun, the finished product. I often, there are surprises that come along. So though I've started with a concrete idea that, that's more like a foundation of a house, ideas come and I integrate them. And sometimes that takes in, enormous leaps of faith Sometimes it means completely surrendering and letting go of ideas that I thought it was going to be, or even of work that I've done. Sometimes I've spent a week on something only to have this idea come to mind and this flooding in my body of yesness and then paint over it. And so, um, yeah, there's always different concepts coming. Um, it's... Uh, it's both. So ideas come, typically my ideas arrive while I'm painting um, or while I'm sometimes while I'm driving, sometimes while I'm falling asleep. They always come in different in different times, but most frequently they come while I'm painting or while I'm in the creative act. Um, Picasso has a quote that I love that says, inspiration does exist, but it must find you working. And I truly believe that. If you're sitting in front of a blank canvas in your studio and your arms are crossed and you're like, hmm, I'm not inspired, that's, that's not inspiring and seducing the muse. That, that's blocking off. So if you're feeling blocked, the creative block, which I believe is a self-perpetuating myth, if you're feeling blocked, try opening, try playing, try making a mess and and freeing up some of that stagnant energy. So uh, something I often would recommend to people that are feeling creatively blocked is dance, move your body, draw in the sand. If you have a beach close by, draw in your driveway with some kids chalk, uh, get a piece of like, if you just got a, a new fridge or a TV or something that has big cardboard or go to the, the um, recycle depot and get a big piece of cardboard, like as big as your body if possible put it down on the floor and grab something that you can make big marks with. Maybe it's a beet or maybe it's a piece of charcoal from the fireplace, cooled charcoal, or maybe it's your kid's markers or, or um, sidewalk chalk and make some marks that, that are expressive and that are 
playful and that are messy and that are wild and free. And I particularly like the idea of doing this at the beach because it's something that you know is impermanent. So you can take wild risks, you can just get into it and you know that the sand is going to be washed away by the tide. You know that the wind is gonna sweep in and dust it. And within 12 hours, that, that creation that maybe spent, you spend hours making will be gone. So do something that is expressive and that I think of as like creative Drano. Because if we are all unique channels, which I truly believe, if we think of ourselves as like faucets and we've maybe not made art in quite a while, maybe our channel or our faucet is all gummed up. It gets blocked, it gets like creatively constipated. And the way like it gets blocked up with, with lots of different things. It gets blocked with um, expectations, with fear, with uh, ideas, um, voices of other people from our childhood maybe, um, maybe from school. Um, it gets totally just bunged up with, with all of this pressure that we put behind our, our muse, all of this pressure that we put on ourselves, that we wear like this weighted blanket. And the best way to flush that through is to really get into your body and play and make a mess. So don't take some brand new canvas. If you're feeling creatively blocked, don't treat yourself to a hundred dollar canvas and unwrap it and have it be perfect and pristine on your easel and then sit there with a, or a fresh sketchbook. If you've ever bought a fresh sketchbook and you open the first page and you're like, ah, what do I do? It's so precious. It's so perfect. I don't want to mess it up. So really before you even touch that fresh canvas, like do treat yourself to it, but don't touch it yet. If you're feeling that pressure that's behind your creative process, get into it, make a mess, mess it up. And then when you do step in front of your canvas, you'll be clearer. And there's still gonna be stuff there. You're still gonna have to work through that, um, the, the resistance, the, the like, um, this Stephen Pressfield calls uh, in the war of art, he talks about the resistance that you're just like, any excuse not to get into the creative flow. Um, there will always be things. There will always be distractions. There will always be your phone that's much easier to pick up and, and cruise um, online or, uh, you know, the pile of laundry that suddenly is way more inspiring than that, that fresh canvas. But if you do, if you are able to flush it out through one of these practices of um, this creative Drano, as I like to think of it, then you will at least arrive to your studio or to your canvas or to your fresh sketchbook um, lighter and with less pressure behind what you might create. It's really, um, it's so important to, to be in the moment in the creative process because if we get ahead of ourselves, like for instance, sometimes some of my paintings spend, I spend hundreds of hours, like 500 hours, some of my more elaborate paintings, which if you were to sit in front of a blank canvas and think, okay, only 500 hours to go. That is so daunting and terrifying and unmotivating that it's the only option is to be present. You know, if we're, if we're traveling through life and we think, okay, only 40 years of this earth school to go, like that is, it's terrifying in that it's so short and it's so long. Whereas if we can just actually feel the wind on our face and listen to the birds in the trees or be present in our conversation um, or be present in the creative process, then that, that moment that might feel very short or very long that if we think of it in the grand scale of the creative process, all of a sudden just becomes a single moment that is altogether ephemeral and immediate and eternal. 
So it's, you know, it's a part of, it's a meditation and it's a meditation that's not always Zen. It's not always this like blissful, elegant brush strokes of, of just juicy flow and inspiration. Sometimes it's work and it's a slog. And you think, oh man, I just started one aspect of this painting that I'm actually going to distribute. Like maybe it's a pattern for the background or something very elaborate. Like one of my recent pieces, Atma, has uh, 24 hands in it and seven faces and a whole background of woven hair of all different colors and textures. And if I had known when I started that painting that that's how detailed and elaborate that painting would have been, I might have reconsidered. I might have... I thought that that painting was actually going to have a very open blank background and uh, that it was going to have a lot of negative space and that it wasn't going to have, it was only going to have three figures, but the ideas came as I worked and I had to, um, I had to be present and I had to show up and I had to listen to the painting. Maybe Neil, would you want to pull that painting up just so we can, can see what I'm talking about of like, see how we see this. Neil's going to screen share. Go Neil. Um, oh, I'm putting him on the spot. There, it's so that painting. That's a 36 inch tall painting. So it's not small, it's not enormous, but it's a pretty good size painting. And it was, it was so much focus that I had to force myself to follow through. When that painting was about 75% finished, it sat in my studio for a year and a half because any blank canvas and splashy beginning was more enticing than the work I knew was ahead in this piece. And it is that finishing phase of a painting that is the most tedious and the most rewarding. So it's that, it's sort of like, I liken it to building a, to building a house, you know, you you lay your foundation, you put up the walls, you put on the roof. People are like, oh my God, your house is almost finished. That's amazing, it's so fast. But if you're a carpenter, you know that you probably still have 10 years of finished carpentry to do. Like my parents have been living in their house for 30 years and they're still waiting for, to do the baseboard around the bathroom. You know, it's just like these little details. So with a painting, you're not going to necessarily live in the painting for, for 30 years, though you might live with it in your studio. It, when it gets to that point where it's almost finished and it's just that finessing that needs to be done, the like refining of the edges, the final glazes, all those little details, bringing out the brightest brights and pushing the darkest darks. That's when I, I give myself no other option but to finish the piece. So I... I literally have to force myself sometimes because it is so seductive to just pull out a fresh canvas. And while that painting was, fin was sitting 90% finished in my studio, I think I painted another 20 paintings. So over the last year, I had a very productive, very inspiring year. Um, and I really attribute this studio space um, to a lot of a lot of that productivity uh, but <laughs> it also could have been that painting sitting there and me being avoidant of the work that it took to finish it that was just so inspiring for me to start a new painting that I just kept starting new paintings and that's okay too sometimes you don't know what's coming next in a piece um, but it's that follow through and that finishing that really is the rewarding aspects and it's the parts that are almost invisible um, to the viewer. They don't really notice those details, uh, but they notice if they're not there. And it really, it, it creates an overall um, harmony that is very, very important. Thank you. Do, you. Wanna, do we have another question? Uh, we, we do. We have a few questions. Um, how do you find reference, uh, references for your art when you do not have a model available? Um, I, yes, my <laughs> Neo just went like this. Um, <laughs> your friends are great models, your family. Um, you can always distort the likeness to shift it. 
um, you can change hair, you can change skin tone, uh, you can change features, you can exaggerate the hips or the lips or whatever it is that, uh, that you need to shift it towards. So that's a great, um, great way. I am my most convenient model. So I actually have used myself for um, many, many of my paintings. My mom used to take photos for me uh, many years ago and she has a really good eye for, for catching like nice angles in postures and good lighting. Um, so that's a, a great way. Or if you have a shutter release for your phone, you can buy like a little, this little button uh, from Staples or Best Buy or Amazon or whatever. Like it's just this little button that you uh, Bluetooth link to your phone. And then if you're using your phone for reference photos, you just hold it in one hand. And sometimes I try to hold it sort of stealthy so that I can still use that hand as reference. Um, and you can get in a position. It's helpful if you have a mirror uh, opposite you so that you can um, see what you're doing. And then you just take a bunch of photos. And I also end up piecing them together. Now, Neo takes great photos for me um, and of me and of him. <laughs> um, and then I also have utilized friends. If you're using any photos from the internet, I strongly recommend that you distort them enough that they're not recognizable. This is a, a form of appropriation and it's absolutely not illegal. It's not plagiarization um, if you are changing it. So just like sampling from a song to create your remix or some, uh, you know, if you're P. Diddy and you're doing your remix that has some like, what was that, Dire Straits in the background. Um, <laughs> but you can only use a certain amount in music. There's like an actual legal uh, amount of, of, I think, eight bars that you're allowed to use before it becomes copyright uh, infringement. Um, so photos are similar. If you're using a photo that another photographer has taken on the internet, um, or that maybe one of your friends, like I've asked, I've seen photos of friends online that have been in beautiful photo shoots and I've reached out to them and the photographer about asking permission. So that Atma painting that I just showed, um, that is uh, a beautiful friend in California and I reached out to uh, her and her friends and the photographer. Um, if you are using just a generic image, try flipping it, try changing the hair, um, change the lighting. It's, it's really just a matter of, um, of being intuitive about it and using, using what's available. Um, I used to use like bird books. I'd be like, oh, I'm going to paint it before the internet was the internet. Um, I would be like, oh, I want to paint an owl. So I'd look through my mom's big like bird encyclopedia and there I have three owl options. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to paint an owl. So I would actually blend and combine those because maybe I want it sitting on something and I want its head looking the other way and the lighting being uh, from this direction. So I end up actually just blending references. And I that's usually how I work is I end up blending multiple references. If you're doing so, an important thing to keep in mind is consistency of light source. So if you're, say you're doing, um, a, a painting that has multiple objects in it uh, and you're using a different, like it has an apple. So you have a reference for an apple. It has a, a, you know, a bunch of spinach. So you have a, I don't know why you paint that, but say you have spinach and then you have a platypus in the background. So find all those photos and make sure that they all have the same directional lighting. You might need to flip the image in order to, for that lighting to be consistent to the other objects or you might actually have to make it up and infer it. So you might um, gather up multiple images of uh, bunches of spinach so that you can um, really see how the light falls across those leaves. And then you would sort of make it up from there. So it really, it ends up being a combination of adhering to a reference and of, um, of intuitively uh, filling in the blanks. But by all means, like, unless you live in a cabin in the woods, hundreds of miles from anybody else and you don't have a phone or a, a camera, you really can make your own reference photos. You really can, um, like I just asked my lion if he would just like sit there and gaze ponderingly. And he was like, yeah, no problem. Where do you want me? Like, how do you want the lighting? So um, obviously I used a photo for that, but I actually combined three photos. 
um, so that I have like the angle that I want. I have the lighting that I want. I have the like look in his eyes that I want. And then I'm just going to make up the main. I'm going to really make up a lot of it and how it merges into the girl. The girl is also a combination of three different images and then a lot from my imagination. Oh, super interesting, Autumn. Um, there's, you know, there's a few questions here in the chat about about staying motivated. Um, uh, one person's just uh, starting out and interested in visionary, visionary art, but still hasn't developed uh, the technical skill. And someone else is uh, curious about uh, like how much time in a day uh, you feel a full-time artist should be painting and also curious about some uh, business uh, tips. So motivation and business questions. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's, that's fine. Well, okay. If you are just starting to paint, do your best to avoid putting pressure on yourself with any shoulds. And if you're, if you're well on your way with painting and you love painting, beware of trying to make it a career. Now this, I'm a strong advocate for, for quitting your day job and taking a leap of faith into your passion and allowing the universe to support you in your creativity. I definitely believe that. However, there's also a double-edged sword there with the, if you, all of a sudden, if you're loving your, your creative process and all of a sudden you need to pay your bills, through your creative creativity, through this art that was until now just a, a beautiful meditative process, it puts so much pressure on, on that process. It puts so much pressure on your inspiration and your productivity. And instead, if you can maybe go slowly with that, maybe instead of quitting your job, maybe you tell your boss you want to go down to four days a week. So you know you're going to have three days a week to paint, or you're going to go down to three days and then you have four days. And so you try to balance your life so that you can um, go gradually and to not have some whiplash of demands and expectations on your art that really can be incapacitating. And it can also be very uh, demoralizing and, uh, and uninspiring. If all of a sudden you're painting for what sells, you're painting for the market, you might think, okay, well, I need to paint what people will buy. I see that they, they buy um, Amanda Sage's art. So I'll paint like Amanda Sage, or I see that they, they like sunsets are really in style right now. Sunsets with, with wine glasses in front of them. I'm going to paint that. And you paint what you think people want. You paint what you think is going to sell and you paint what you see other people succeeding at. And when you paint that way, when you create from that place, it's not necessarily authentic to what wanted to come out of you or come through you. You're, you're tailoring it to what you think the world wants of you. And as anybody that's gone into a career that they don't love knows, it's a very, it's, it's fruitless in, in a lot of ways. Yeah, you can make some money and you can like hit your target market and be really strategic about it. And, and you're like, I'm going to paint people doing yoga and I'm going to go to all the yoga conventions and I'm going to sell my paintings of people doing yoga. If you don't, if you don't love yoga, if you don't love the, the process of painting those poses and what they represent, there, there ends up being a hollowness to it. And really truly what I believe people respond to in art, in any kind of art, is authenticity. And so the fact that my art has gained the audience that it has, I don't particularly believe that it's because I'm a skilled painter or because I paint subject matter that people really like. Like sure, yeah, people like pretty girls and lions. Okay. And yeah, when they look at it, they might be like, oh, I can see you put a lot of time into that. That's like well painted. But there's also, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of very skilled draftspeople in the world. So what, what makes an artist successful or, or not? And I truly believe that what the audience craves on a cellular and soul level is authenticity. And when you can show up in front of your canvas and letting go of 
of a lot of those stories and expectations and demands and just truly paint what bubbles through and up and out of you, listening to the creative process, listening to the painting, listening to those ideas that percolate as you're falling asleep and it feels right in your body, that's what people connect with. It's a term um, I've heard called energetic imprinting. And so it's this, this idea that when, when you create something, whether it's food, whether it's performance art, whatever it is, there's a, pre there's a presence that you imprint onto that, that creation that exists as long as it creates uh, or as, as long as it exists. Exists, yeah, you know what I mean. So it's there, people can feel it. Um, for, for years later, if you've ever visited um, one of the, like a, an art museum and you've stood in front of a painting, say it's a Da Vinci, or if you've gone to the Sistine Chapel and you've stood under the, under the roof of the Sistine Chapel that Michelangelo painted, or you've stood in front of, maybe it's a painting that's at a cafe that is just painted by a local artist that you don't know anything about and you stood there and you've cried, you've wept, or you've felt this welling of emotion. To me, what that is, what I believe that is, is that it is a connection of authenticity. It's a true mirror and it's tapping into something that's beyond the surface of the canvas. It's beyond the paint and the subject matter and the technique. It is, it's emotion, it's spirit, it's inspiration flowing through. So as far as, okay, going back to the, the motivation topic, let that be your motivation. And if you're finding that you're not motivated to paint, then maybe try something different as far as subject matter or medium. Like try one of the, the practices that I described before of like making a big mess, something that you know you can't keep. You know, no matter how much you love that charcoal drawing on the back of the fridge cardboard box, you know you're not gonna hang that in a museum. It's not archival, it's on garbage. Let it be, let it remain as such. And you know, burn it after or take it back to the Recycle Depot. Don't try to preserve it forever. You might document it um, and keep a photo of it, but there's something so freeing about um, just creating for the sake of creating and not creating for any kind of means to an end, not trying to make it a commodity, not trying to, you know, have it kept forever. Just allow it to exist for that moment in time, like a sand sculpture. And that, I, I believe that that process will fuel your motivation. Um, now, that said, in this day and age, we have any number of distractions. I definitely fall into that myself, um, as I know I'm not alone in doing. Uh, it's so much easier, or maybe it's impulsive and addictive to pick up our phones, to be distracted by um, the online world, by social media, um, or by all the chores that's involved in, in living, running a household, self-care. Um, so there's always going to be other things demanding your attention. I don't believe in any shoulds around like, I should paint eight hours a day, or I should uh, complete this many paintings per year. Sometimes I'll paint um, for 15 hours in a day. Sometimes I don't paint for six days. And I really just allow it to ebb and flow as it needs to uh, for my lifestyle, for the other demands in my life. Um, if you are, if you are um, acting, if, if art is your business, then you know that a lot of that time, a lot of your time that you would like to be spending painting is actually spent on um, administration, on promotion, on online responding to emails. And as you, as you grow in your business, you will probably find that you need to um, implement systems and get people on your team that can support you in that. Um, but as you're beginning, it's gonna be like you going to the post office, you making the boxes to pack the prints or pack the paintings and you going to the post office and standing in line. And that's a lot of time that you would like to be probably spending painting, but there is a balance point there that, um, it's just an ebb and flow. If you work well with structure, um, then by all means, set an alarm on your on your um, on your 
phone or whatever. I hate to keep bringing it back to the phone, but that is our everything these days. Um, set an alarm and know that you're going to do two, three hour sessions a day. And you give yourself an hour for lunch and you, you structure your days that way. And then you give yourself a weekend and you don't go in the studio for that weekend. If that's the way you work, then celebrate that and work with that. It's not the way I work. Um, before I, uh, when I was working, before I became a full-time um, self-sustaining artist, I was a waitress and bartender and that was anything but consistent. So I just would paint when I was able. I would um, always travel with my paints and uh, just, it would just fill my, the gaps in my schedule. Um, now it is my schedule, but like I said, there's a lot of other things that come along with it. Thank you. Thank you, Autumn. Um, so we've got a couple questions about art materials, uh, and I just let like everyone to know that I will um, send a list of the recommended studio art materials that we had posted in the advertisement of today's events. Uh, in that list, you had mentioned you liked using golden fluid acrylics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I find this very interesting because acrylics come in a wide variety of viscosities from heavy bodied fluid to inks. Um, so I'm curious as to um, why you choose to work with fluids. And um, there's also a couple of questions about uh, if you use any mediums or retarders while you're working with them. Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, yeah, I love golden fluid acrylics uh, because they are already thinned to a viscosity that is, for my style, perfectly workable. Um, I've got a few bottles here. They come in various sizes, but you can see this is ta -da, titanium white. So if you're working from tube paint, that's like in a classic like toothpaste style tube and you're squeezing it out and it holds its shape just like toothpaste would on your palette, um, you're probably finding, unless you work um, very textured, and build up a lot of texture and, and um, different brush strokes on your canvas, you're probably finding that you're thinning down your paint a lot in order to work with it. So I used to use a lot of water um, and thin it out. But what happens when you mix water with paint is if you imagine paint as um, it's minerals, right? So those are microscopic pebbles. They're like little rocks of stone or of mineral and they're held in a binder and what a binder is with oil paint it's usually linseed oil um, it's creating sort of a viscous um, goo that holds all those little pebbles in place with watercolors it's water and with acrylic paints it's polymer it's plastic or acrylic medium um, similar to like white glue um, it dries clear it looks white when it's wet uh, when there's no pigment in it. So if you've ever used like a glazing medium or a matte medium or gloss medium, they look white until they dry and then they're usually quite clear. Um, so that's really what, what acrylic paint is, is it's pebbles suspended in goo. And when you thin it out with water, what happens just like watercolor is all of those little pebbles get distributed across the surface of the canvas. And if you then come in with another uh, layer on top and you're maybe you're doing a little bit of scumbling or you're brushing um, with a, with your paintbrush what happens is you can pull up those little pebbles because they no longer have the glue that's holding them to the surface of the canvas um, so just like watercolor how you can come in after that painting might be dry for months and you can come and you can actually lift those pebbles up they're microscopic pebbles but you can lift up that color with a wet paintbrush again um, acrylic can do something similar and it can be very frustrating in the layering process. So if you are using thick bodied acrylics or even regular body acrylics out of the tube, um, instead of mixing in purely water, you might want to mix in um, a, a fluid medium of some kind. And there are a lot of mediums. Acrylics, when they first came out, I think in the 40s, um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but yeah, they first came out uh, in the first half of the, of the 20th century, they were, they were very plasticky. They were not nice colors. They were not uh, very, very nice uh, texture to work with. And they really got a bad rep. 
Um, however, over the last many decades, they have come so far. The technology of acrylic has really advanced. There are so many new mediums. The, the pigments are true. There's gorgeous colors. It's a wide, wide array of colors and mediums. You can do crackle pastes and sand pastes and, and uh, thinning agents. And you can use retarder. And what retarder is, is it retards the, the drying time. So it slows the drying time, which gives it more of, um, more of a feel of oil paint. I've I played with retarder for a couple of years, many years ago, and I didn't actually like it because I found that it did pretty much what water does and is it compromised the binding integrity and made it so it was susceptible to lifting those layers up. So after years of me thinning out my paints, I discovered this uh, golden fluid acrylic and I love them because it's it's thinned to the perfect viscosity to just apply right to the canvas for my style. I paint in very, very thin coats, many, many, many layers um, to the point that when you look at the painting from the side, you can't actually usually see many brush strokes. It looks very smooth. Um, and so those golden fluids are just already in that perfect consistency to get those thin layers while still um, having very strong pigment loads and being very true in their colors. So it's sort of like the difference between painting with peanut butter or painting with maple syrup. It's, they are like a maple syrup. It goes on, it still has some thickness to it, but it goes on very smooth and it's very blendable. Thank you for all that information. Um, I have a really cute question here. How do you make your paintings glow, stars and such? Ooh, <laughs> magic. Um, well, I do have sort of a motto as I'm painting of never too many glowy orbs. I love painting glowy orbs and stars and magic. Um, well, there's there's a couple different things that can happen um, when you're layering paints. There's um, multiple ways to, to build up light in paintings. Uh, one, like, one is working with transparencies on top of white. So if you start with a blank canvas and you add transparent colors, on top, it's like layering panes of glass, of, of stained glass. So imagine you um, have a bright light, um, which we'll say is representing the white canvas. And on top of that bright light, you're gonna put a pane of yellow glass. And then you're gonna put a pane of red glass. And when the yellow and red combine with the light shining through them, that's optic color mixing and it creates orange. So you can keep layering these, these colors on top in transparencies and that light will keep shining through. It will get darker and darker because no matter how bright of a yellow pane of glass you put in front of that light, it's still darker than clear. So even though it's a very, very bright yellow, it's still going to darken that yellow and every layer you put on top is going to darken that white. So keeping in mind that if you're gonna work in that way with the transparencies, you need to err on the side of light. If you're creating an underpainting or you have some, some, um, some object developed underneath that you just wanna glaze these transparencies on top, you need to have it lighter so that as you push it back with these, with these glazing colors, um, that light can still shine through. So that's one way to create glow. Um, you also can work with white on top of your colors or you can work in a combination of, of bringing the whites back on top and then glazing on top of those. But what happens when you bring the white on top of the colors is it brings that object more into the foreground. It brings it forward. It makes it, um, it's opaque. So the, the difference between opaque and translucent versus transparent, that's like those panes of glass are more translucent or transparent. And then the white on top of the painting um, later in the stage is, the is opaque. And so if you're creating glows, you can, if you're working in acrylic, you can use that bridging technique that I was talking about uh, earlier, where you might create like a white dot or a white orb, and then mix in a little bit of your background color to make a color that's halfway or a shade halfway between the white of that, of that glowy orb and your background. And you might run a circle around it to create this optical illusion of a glow. And then you can work more and more bridges into that, um, working towards the white and towards the background, which is gonna create this gradation, which creates the optical illusion of a glow. 
you can then glaze on top of that, um, which will then push it all back, but it will create that luminosity of the light shining through. And really what, what um, some of the beauty of acrylic these days is working with those transparencies, especially in combination with the opacities and working back and forth glazing, like pushing, pushing stuff back into the shadows and then bringing the lights back out and then pushing them back again, going back and forth and back and forth, which I explain a lot in my tutorials and, and when I'm teaching, um, that creates this, this vibrancy and this like pulsing glow that is very similar to oil painting. Um, to the finished effect of oil paintings and to the point that sometimes people actually can't tell the difference between the two because there is so much luminosity created. Acrylics traditionally are very chalky and plasticky looking and it's through these thin layers and building up and allowing that color, that optic color mixing that creates that luminosity and that glow and actually creates new colors that you can't mix straight out of the tube because they're actually colors that are made of light instead of colors that are made of pigment. pigment. It's the light interfacing with the pigment as it goes through all those layers of, of stained glass, bouncing back and hitting the eye and creating new relationships. And it changes throughout the day. It depends on your lighting. It's, it really is interactive. Fascinating. Um, thank you for all of that, Autumn. Um, question, what is visionary art? <laughs> It's a very interesting and elusive uh, question. Um, and it's something that I've really, I've pondered for many years. I've been part of the visionary art um, movement uh, and community for, um, let's say 14, 15 years. And um, it's to me, well, really all art is visionary. If you think on a very fundamental level, you're creating something out of the void that now exists. It's your mind and your heart and your spirit and the creative process itself speaking through and becoming manifest. Um, so yeah, all art is visionary. However, the like quote unquote visionary art movement is um, more characterized by uh, a lot of it's sort of by subject matter, but what I really think that the, that visionary art has in common across the board, regardless of style, because some visionary art is very psychedelic. Some of it's very trippy, like fractals and very busy, very elaborate, um, very wild. Some visionary art, like mine, I'd say, yeah, I'm still within the visionary art movement, but my work tends to be a bit more into the magic realism or the surrealism, the figurative realism, um, always sort of shifting depending on my subject matter and how many how many sacred geometry glowy orbs I have in the background. Um, but what it all has in common, I believe, and especially since being part of that community and really getting to know so many of the artists, um, is it's speaking forward. It's, it's a language of light and it's a language of faith and hope. And I, I think of of these paintings and of art as, as signposts really um, that have the ability to support the viewer, the artist and humanity on a forward trajectory um, through the heart, through the spirit, through reconnection to divinity, through the mirror of beauty, through the mirror of connection um, through relationship with nature and with the cosmos and with each other. Um, to me, it's much more about the intention and the heart and that energetic imprint that I was talking about previously. It's about that rather than specifically the style. That said, you could look at, say, Alex Gray is like the granddaddy of visionary art. Um, and you could say that's, that's quintessential visionary art. Um, but there are so many styles now of visionary art that have come out over the last few decades. Um, and it's really, it's very, very diverse. Um, so yeah, I say I, I'm in the visionary art movement. I'm part of that visionary art community and my art is visionary art. 
but it's also magic realism. And it comes back into that labeling thing. So if I'm going to label my art as a certain kind of movement, like people say, what kind of music do you like? I'm like, I don't know, yummy music. It's like, how does it make me feel? Sometimes it's classical. Sometimes it's crunchy beats of like dance music. And it's, to me, it's more about the energetic imprint of that music. It's how it feels in my body and art is the same way. So I don't lock myself into the, the label of visionary art or magic realism or psychedelic art or whatever it is because every painting is different and I need to stay open to the journey of that painting without um, feeling like I need to tailor it a certain way to be part of some body of work if that makes sense. Absolutely thank you. Um, do you have any advice for, um, for someone who wants to share their work with the world outside of social media techniques? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm a strong believer in going to your local coffee shop and asking if you can hang your art. Um, especially if you see that they have regular shows of other art artists there, or if they already have art on their walls, Go and just talk to the manager and ask if you can hang a show. There is something so valuable about learning, for one, the very like technical, logical, physical way of how to hang art on the wall, how to paint the edges of your canvas, how to label it, make it feel like, you know, a completed product, make it look professional, varnishing, all the finished hanging wires, all the finishing little details that are not, um, that are somewhat invisible, um, unless you know to look for them. So that's very valuable, learning how to tell a story in the sequence of paintings of like, what looks good where, what direction is the, if there's a figure in it, and they're looking in a certain direction, what direction are they looking, you might not want to have them looking into a corner of the room, maybe I'm going to put it on the other side of the room. So it's looking out the window, or it's looking at the front desk, or it's looking in a certain way. So you tell a story, you create an environment, and you actually invite people into the experience of those paintings now as a whole new piece of art. They're no longer individuals. They are still little vignettes. They are um, their own painting and each window can be um, a unique experience. But as a whole, when somebody walks into that room and they start working their way around, how do they experience that art as one experience, as like a story that they're witnessing? So that's very valuable if there is the option. And this could be like, I have my work at a local realtor that helped us buy our property. There's like restaurants, there's lawyers offices, there's dentist offices, there's all these different places. If you're familiar with, with your, your community and like go around and see who has nice lighting, who has nice walls, who gets traffic, because by hanging in these public places, you're not just preaching to the choir of your you know, your family and friends that are like, oh, great painting, um, or like your very specific community, you're actually accessing a cross section of society by hanging in public places. And if you have the option, um, ask the manager, whoever, wherever it is that you're showing, if you can have an opening, if you can have a reception night and, you know, splurge a little bit, get some grapes and make some fruit platters and serve some kombucha or some wine, if you're allowed or whatever it is, create create an event around it. Um, if you want to give like a little talk, or if you want to um, have some music playing or something like that, use it as an opportunity to, again, create an experience for people to enter into. And people are very, very, um, especially after the last few years, there's this longing for connection, there's longing for experience. And so by by not just relying on that social media platform and the online experience, you can invite people out into their community to connect with you and with their community and with real physical paintings that are hanging in front of them. And that is such a rich, valuable experience right now. Um, and it, again, it will also teach you very, very important lessons about how to talk about your art, how to display your art, how to ask, um, or how to state the price. When somebody asks you, how much is that painting? And you're like, $500 and you put a question mark at the end and you're apologizing for it. 
that's not convincing them that it's worth $500. So when they ask the price, say it's $500 or it's $5,000, and they're going to take that or leave that. There's always going to be somebody that says your painting is worth more or worth less. And nobody really matters other than you. So just like somebody who says that painting is crap or that painting is the best painting I've ever seen. That's it's great to have feedback and you learn from feedback, but you cannot rely on praise and you cannot be defeated by criticism. Because if we're constantly going through life, waiting for the feedback um, according to you know, our art or our prices or our person, then we are spending our whole life in this like push pull of what other people expect and what other people's preferences are. All we are responsible to is our own authenticity and our own creative outflow, our own unique channel. And so I price the way that I paint. I price intuitively. Anything less, I'd rather keep it because these are born of my, of my creative bliss. They are my dance with the divine. They're very valuable to me. And if somebody asks me the price and I state it, they may or may not agree that it's worth that, but that's not up to me. And you never know, you can, you can have these events and don't be discouraged. If you have an event, if you have a show and you hang your art in a cafe and nothing sells, don't be discouraged. I've done so many shows that I don't sell work at, but you never know the connections that are made. Maybe somebody takes your business card, have business cards, very important. Somebody takes your business card, they give it to their uncle. That uncle gives it to his lawyer and that lawyer's wife goes to your website a year later and buys three paintings. You never know where these connections are gonna come or somebody that says, oh my gosh, I'm doing, uh, I'm making an album. I, can you do my album art? Or there's so many different directions that, that uh, those connections can go in. So just really show up, make it easy for people. So I believe in having labels on the wall. Some people will say, oh no, never have prices on the wall. It's, it goes either way. It does change the experience by having a price because people cannot help but look at the price of a painting if it's posted on the wall. However, a lot of people are not going to work very hard. They want to support the art. They want to bring this experience and this inspiration into their home. But if they have to chase you down for it, they might not work very hard at it. They say like with uh, brick and mortar stores on, on a sidewalk that you're walking down the street for every step you have to step up to go into a store. They say there's some statistic of like you lose 10% of your clientele. And they say with websites, it's the same kind of thing. For every click that you have to make in order to complete a purchase, you're losing a percentage of your clientele. So the same way, if somebody's standing in a, in a show and they're waiting to talk to you because they're really interested in that painting over there, but they don't know how much it is. They don't know how to go about buying it. They're just like waiting and they don't get a chance to talk to you. And then they're like, ah, eh, actually, mm, maybe I don't need it. So have business cards available so you're easily reachable and have prices, have maybe somebody else that's like scouting for you. Maybe it's your mommy. Maybe it's somebody that's like, really believes in your art that's like hey what do you think of that art and when they see somebody like really looking or talking to their partner about like ooh, the money you can tell that they're like discussing maybe bringing that work into their home then have somebody that's like maybe goes up and chats with them about it and just really um experiment i started hanging art in cafes when i was 13 and uh, i haven't stopped I still hang my art in cafes because I really believe in bringing, making art accessible, bringing it into the world of the people and connecting people in different ways. And just because a painting doesn't sell doesn't mean it didn't change somebody's life or day or experience or relationship to themselves or to each other. It's, we'll never know what, what the, the true fruit of that painting is. You know, they might buy a painting, you get that money, that 500 bucks, you spend it on some new art supplies and it's gone. But the true fruit of a painting's effect in the world is stuff that you'll never see. It's the stories and the echoes on of people having that with them while they're grieving their grandmother or taking it traveling with them and it becoming a conversation piece that then they meet their beloved and end up getting married and moving to Italy or something like it's really you never know the journey that that 
art is going to go on. So trust it, be a steward to it, and really be in service to getting it out in the world. And that's in many different ways. And yeah. Thank you so much for that, Autumn. Um, there, there's a question here about uh, how you start off painting and if you have a preference for a, a blank white gessoed canvas or uh, if you like to get in there and do a colored underpainting. Both. I, uh, it depends on the painting. Um, there is something very lovely about a blank canvas. And I often will tone the canvas a certain color or do some splashy backgrounds um, and then do my drawing on top of that. Um, but a lot of the time, like with the painting behind me, that's still just the, the um, gessoed background of the white in behind them. And I just sketched the, the figures right on the, the white and then I'm building it up from there. It, um, it's, there's not a, a wrong way to do it. And I don't have a tried and true way that I only do it that way. Sometimes I do underpaintings in gray tones, um, especially if you've done my tutorial or taken any of my classes, we work in, in gray underpaintings with uh, what I say gray, but it's actually a raw umber and titanium white so that we can focus on building the form like a carving and then we glaze it through transparent colors on top and that creates a lot of luminosity um, while, while not getting hung up, hung up on the warms and cools in the, in the painting process if you're learning. But so, yeah, sometimes I paint straight into skin tones. Sometimes I paint uh, just in black and white underneath and it's always different and just play, just experiment, have fun. You might find like sometimes I paint everything sort of a, a brilliant uh, orange. There's a color that I love. So let's see if I can show you here. It's transparent red iron oxide. It's like, it's like an orangey, browny red with a lot of yellow in it when it's really thinned out. And it's so, I use the word juicy. It's not to say to drink it, but it's like, it's so juicy. It's so rich and lovely. It's also very transparent. So it works great in glazes. Um, so that's a really nice underpainting color that you can work just in, um, in that and white uh, and then build your, your shadows on top. Um, yeah, just play, experiment. There's, uh, there's no, the only rules in art are there to be broken, I think. And you just, like, it's, it's one of the only things that you can literally do anything you want. Anything. You know, there's rules in music that if you play two chords together, it sounds horrible. And there are, like, some rules in art where you can put clashing colors, but people use clashing colors all the time. There's, you know the idea of, um, of composition rules. You can break composition rules as part of your composition and it actually will make that painting even better. So know those rules, know when to break them, know when to adhere to them, um, know the pitfalls of, of certain elements, but know when you, like, that you can literally do anything you want. You can create worlds that never existed before and only you could imagine. So whether you prime your canvas or do a grayscale or draw in the sand, it doesn't really matter. It's totally up to you how you wanna play. Thank you so much, Autumn. Um, so I guess any, any questions about um, taking photos of your work that you would like to then um, create say cards with or other you know bags or whatever it might be yeah documentation is very important having high resolution good quality images of your work um, is very important for reproduction but also just really important for the canon of your work and for um for keeping track of your your archives and knowing so you can see your journey you can refer back to them. Um, it's, it's very helpful to be able to see the progress of your work. But if you are wanting to make, um, make reproductions, then high quality, high, high resolution photos are a must or scans. So you can either photograph or you can scan. If you live in a city that has um, an art scanning uh, service, 
then that's a great way to go. It's actually like a flatbed, large format scanner. They lay the painting down, it scans it, does like multiple passes and creates a very, very true image. I typically photograph. Um, it also, it, it, the lighting can shift a little bit um, with photographs and, and with that, like the ideas of light being able to bounce through layers of the paint. I really like working with natural light. So if I take the photo myself for smaller pieces, I uh, take the photos myself. And um, for larger pieces, I have them for professionally photographed uh, just because it's, it's that much more important. If you're taking a, a, a photograph and you're blowing it up to a large, uh, a large tapestry, say, you really want that photograph to be very, very high quality. Um, if you are taking photos yourself, the best uh, environment to take them in is an overcast day outside and just take a number of photographs move the canvas around here and there so that you can get a feel for what um, what position makes the lighting the best and creates the least amount of glare there's always going to be glare particularly from the sky and so try to have it vertical or some in some instances it actually makes sense to lay it flat so just take multiple photographs um, square up your camera so that it's not fully to the edge of the view screen, um, but it's just jogged in a little bit, but it is square. So try to make sure that it's not like distorted this way or that way. Um, just really square that up. And then you'll probably find that you need to take it onto your computer, crop it in and adjust it through Photoshop of uh, maybe there's like a hair on it or something like that. You can clean those up with the comb brush tool. Um, and if you get it professionally photographed, there's typically, even if you live in a small town, there will be some, some photographer or other professional artist that uh, is open to um, you hiring them to photograph your work. So just look around. If you have, if you don't know where to look, try asking online if you have like a Facebook message board forum or other artists or go into a gallery and ask there. Um, people are typically very helpful. Um, I think in general, artists get excited that other people are excited about art. So if you're excited about art and you're just starting and you go talk to a professional artist, most of them, I won't say all, but most people, most artists are gonna be pumped and they're gonna give you everything they can give you to support because truly it's there's competition within art is sort of a, a myth like yes there's finite resources there's finite audience to a certain extent but everybody paints so uniquely everybody creates if you're creating from an authentic place only you can paint like that so the more people that are interested in art the more audience there is for it and and it's it's really um it's just a growing ever blossoming community of art and art supporters so just ask questions to your to your local professionals and also look online there's a lot of information online of like how to photograph your art or how to stretch a canvas or how to varnish a painting like those those are not questions that you necessarily need to bother professional artists with because their inboxes are probably quite full and their time is valuable. Whereas, you know, like question, more intimate questions are, are great and, and recommendations of local resources are um, often thing, things that people are happy to share. This is very true. Open, so we've got your back, everyone. Technical questions, just give yeah. us a call. <laughs> Um, so Autumn, so we're, we're coming to the close, uh, we're coming close to closing time here. Um, but I'm just wondering, so, um, with, with like where you're moving in the new year and, um, Opus has been asking, uh, artists in the community about what it means to exist in a state of, I wonder as an artist and, uh, how, how to move forward. Mm. with that feeling <laughs> well the whole the whole creative process is constantly that question and it might come in different forms and different words but um, I think anytime that you open your sketchbook or sit down in front of your canvas whether it's well developed or a fresh white canvas 
um, that's the question that is the fuel really is I wonder, I, I wonder where this will take me. I wonder whether this will feel alive for me. I wonder what it will look like or whether it will be a challenging process or an easeful process. Some paintings practically paint themselves and other ones are a bit more work. And um, so the, the, just the curiosity I think is the main fuel of creativity, being curious. And that's what I wonder is to me, it's, it's the opening, it's the attention, it's, it's being aware and curious and unattached and allowing things to come. And so you asked about this next year for me, I, I don't know, I wonder, I don't, I don't get too hung up on what I think it should look like. Um, I really am just just delighted by the process and I'm along for the ride and I show up to the best of my ability. I do the best I can. I get as much sleep as I need ideally and I eat nutritious food and I stay present as much as possible in each moment, whether I'm making art or whether I'm doing anything else. I try to really savor the experience of being. Um, so that wherever I find myself, whether that's in the, my studio or not, I am approaching each moment with that same curiosity. And it really, the, the, the process of art making has been my greatest teacher. It has taught me so much about how I want to walk in the world, about how to approach each moment, about how to release control um, about how to be curious and unattached and show up and do my best about that balance of yin yang about um, about focus and attention and intention and surrender and allowing and getting out of the way it's um, it's all everything comes up in the creative process so if you're sitting in front of your canvas and your mind is going through its cycles of internal story and dialogue of like criticism and pressure and fear and dread and avoidance and resistance really stay curious be compassionate first and foremost to yourself to your own maybe your own inner child who was told that they weren't good at art or that they um they aren't creative or that that's not a real job or you know grow up and and go to work, all the different stories that could feed into why it might be very scary to make art. Um, and that's pretty universal. You are not alone. It is not unique. You are, a, a, you are a unique version of those stories, but everybody has those, those voices. And so as they come up, really be curious about what they are showing you. And um, do you need to be, uh, do you need to pay more attention and keep more focused, sit down and take it more seriously? Or do you need to cut yourself some slack, take a breather and play? You know, do we, are we too hard on ourselves or are we avoidant to follow through? Are we um, afraid of beginning something or are we afraid of finishing something? There are so many questions that we can, that we can ask ourselves with the template, the very, very safe container, um, an expansive container of art making. And with that template, it will lead us to amazing vistas of self inquiry and discovery. So the more familiar and gentle you can be in the creative process, the more you will feel empowered in your life to reach certain points certain decisions in life and oh there's that feeling in my body of the filling or the draining that I'm so familiar with from my art process I know that this is for my highest good even though I don't understand yet I know that I will in time it'll all make sense so that's that's where I am in this moment I'm right here and uh I'm we'll see what happens
I love it. Thank you so much. Wow. So inspiring. Such a delight to be here with you today, Autumn, and everyone for logging, logging in and joining us. I feel so inspired and uh, it's such a beautiful community, arts community. Um, so I, this is a little bit of a wind up. So big, huge thank you. And I just hope to see you all again here sometime in, in the future. And I hope you have a beautiful, creative day and um, that you're not afraid to move into your curiosities. Um, make art, dance, be happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> thank you so much for having me and thank you everyone for joining us. This is, uh, yeah, it's it's been a very fun and uh and open process to just uh listen to your questions and see what shows up so thank you for being part of the co-creation and i'm so honored to be a cheerleader on your on your creative path my motto is you're doing great me and neo are constantly chanting that we have stickers we hand out you're doing great you're doing great and that great is always getting better so just keep moving forward just keep showing up and uh we got this Thank you. Thank you, everyone.